Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, again, apologize. Apologies for my technical difficulties. Uh, we're a few minutes after the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started with this meeting. This is the uh, Monday, April 26th uh, Finance Committee Workshop, and we are meeting tonight to review the school budget portion of the of the budget with the um, school finance committee, the school board finance committee. And uh, I am just gonna go ahead and turn it over. I guess, to, am I turning it over to Phil or Donna or? Phil. Okay, great. Thanks, Phil. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, and thanks for having us here tonight. Uh, I'm gonna go through our budget and sort of some main sort of where we, how we got, where we got, where we landed and a little background. Um, and then obviously take questions at the end um, or throughout for that matter, if people have questions. Um, we have a slideshow and Marcy, my, my technology doesn't allow me to share it. So Marcy's gonna be the driver here. So we'll get this up and running. Great. Um, and you can move to the next slide, Marcy. And thank everyone for coming and thank for fellow board members. And um, I just wanna start out by saying, um, and I know you know this as a town councilor, but a lot of the work, the hard work really is the staff that put together these budget proposals in response to our questions and our policy directives. Um, and and the, the real hard work really was uh, from the superintendent, the business manager, on down to each of the building, building principals and other administrators. Um, this is a budget that we're very proud of and I'll, I'll take you through why. Um, and I just start with this quote that um, my predecessor finance chair um, Elizabeth uh, had on her slide and I kept last year and I kept it because I, I think we all know this, high quality public education is essential to democracy and the future of um, humanity. And it's a resource for all in the down payment on the future. Uh, but I particularly think that we, we really believe that and live that in this community. And it's something that's very important to us in Cape Elizabeth to ensure that we have um, really the best school district we can have. Um, and it's a reason why a lot of people um, choose to live in our community other than the fact that it's a beautiful place to live with good people. Um, if you go uh, continue on, Marcy. W what we did to get here, and I think this is important, it's, it started before my tenure, um, was uh, as an initial matter, we have a sort of year-round finance subcommittee of the town council and school board, which I find really valuable. And I, uh, this is, we meet once a month and it's the uh, town manager and superintendent along with the school board and town council chair and finance committee chair and the business managers of each of each department, if you will, um, entity. And it's, it's a really good opportunity to share where we are in the process of our budgeting, um, eliminating surprises on expenditures that may be coming up and um, just generally be a good source of exchange of information. And so I found it to be invaluable um, all along this process. And this is my first year um, chairing this particular committee. Also leading up to this, and you may already have, you know, last year there was a needs assessment going on in buildings and that was completed. And then the building committee um, continued to meet. And the building committee met over the course of well over a year. It was a very um, large, in my opinion, relatively large committee that was made up of um, not only the school board and town council members, but also um, administrators, teachers, uh, parents, and other um, other members of the community, voters in the community, quite frankly, taxpayers in the community. Um, and in this in this past year, the, the, that building committee had voted on a recommendation, which um, I'm sure you've seen was to um, the eventual replacement of of the, both the elementary school and the middle school based on based on the needs assessment. And we, uh, as a school board, adopted those recommendations. That we've also received monthly budget updates from the business manager at each of our meetings. We constantly um, and, and intensely study and seek revenues and savings. So I can speak that there's no one better than that, than, um, than Donna and Marcy. They, they uh, find every opportunity they can um, to seek out grants and, and funding that we may not have known about or um, that we may not have taken advantage of in the past. And we've uh, really, really um, are better for it uh, that they've been able to really pull money where, wherever we can. Um, there's been some COVID related funding and expenditure issues. It's been a busy year for us, as you can imagine. Um, there, there were three rounds of funding. We'll get into that a little bit about how, how we uh, as a school district benefited. Um, 
but also some of the expenditures we've had to, to make as a result. Um, there's also been a yearly audit, as you know, I, I, I was at that meeting of school finances. Um, next slide, please. We adopted budget goals, um, and I just want to read them because this is really what, what motivated and um, uh, uh, outlined our work. So first, we're going to move our district together forward with our strategic plan goals. I'm going to briefly go over what those are on the next slide. That's our overall district goals. We're going to, this budget is going to empower students with the academic, personal, and social knowledge and skills to build balanced and purposeful lives. We want to make sure that it ensures equity and access to opportunities for all CAPE students. Um, this is something, this fourth bullet is something we added um, after we'd already started the process. When it became clear to us, we wanted this not, although we, I think we all uh, knew it, we wanted to make sure it was explicit. So we added this budget goal was to prioritize the return to full-time in-person learning and support post-pandemic academic and social emotional needs of all students um, and the expenditures in order to, I think there's a typo there, of all students in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. And then finally, and this is something we've carried over um, not a slightly, uh, slightly amended version, but we always want to reflect a careful examination of light items and the consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Next slide, please. I'm just going to read the bullets here, but um, the, the bold, but these are our school board um, five year strategic plan goals that we've adopted. I think it was a year ago now. Um, and so we incorporate these by reference into our budget goals. And it's the health and well being global competency, multiple pathways and definitions of success, safe, sustainable, and effective facilities. And again, that, I get to that with the building committee and the, and, uh, and the work we're, we're doing to implement those recommendations and environmental responsibility. Next slide, please. So just briefly, I'm just gonna go through the process of what we, what we went through. We had a budget workshop, our initial budget workshop um, was on January 26th that we heard from all building principals and department heads. Um, and we received an original request budget. Um, we submitted questions in writing after that and compiled them, posted online and shared with the school board and appropriate administrators. I had a chance to answer those questions. Well, we learned, one of the things we learned at that meeting is that we had a modest increase this year in the state aid um, from schools. We, we don't typically, as I'm sure all you know, get, get all that substantial amount of made from the state based on our, um, our uh, valuation and other factors here. But, um, but it's, it, it was a move in the right direction because we had, what you, didn't, you don't see there was the FY18 was also a substantial decrease uh, cut. Um, I just put the last five years. Um, so we, we're still not back to where we were from six years ago or more, but um, we've had at least some increases now for three years in a row. And uh, we'll take it, even though it was not that much more. Uh, next, next slide. So on February 23rd, we continued with questions and answers. Um, really digging into the request, the original, and seeing where um, what's needed and what's potentially not, or what we could put off. Um, March second, we had a we had an explanation of the essential programs and services. And that's the funding I just talked about, the state funding, and and what it's based on, and a discussion of our fund balance. Um, uh, again, EPS is the minimum amount to fund a school district at its bare bones level, not a guide for funding high performing schools. We always have a great presentation on that from both Marcy, but also um, Mr. Shedd at the high school who has a great, if you haven't seen it, he's done it a couple of years now and there's a handout where it, he really digs into how you come up with these numbers, what the financing is based on and then why that really does prepare to bare bones um, what you would have to have by statute um, to run a school. And that's not something that Cape Elizabeth or many most schools in the state, uh, quite frankly, want. So we go above and beyond that um, for our policy. Again, we continue with the question and answers, and that happened at every single meeting. And there's always a really good back and forth. Uh, next slide. So March 23rd, we we really we had a more in-depth review of staffing and enrollment, which is you know staffing is our major budget driver. It's over 84 percent of our costs, and in this we are guided. And I just alluded to this, but we are guided by our school board class size policy, um, and we so we target our uh, our expenditures and our, our staffing, I should say to that policy. It's a recommendation, but it's one we, we, try, we try to follow when we can, or guidelines, I should say, and teacher loads. We also got an update on health insurance and, and the COVID relief funds at this meeting, um, and we continue to discuss the fund balance. Next slide. Um, this is something we talk about every year is, is um, we're under, you know, school departments are under a lot of mandates that 
we don't have control over. And if you've seen the handout, I know it gets talked about a lot, but it, it's sort of, a, as a school board member, you, you, it's a fold out that's almost as half as tall as I am um, in terms of the number of uh, mandates that under both federal, I think it's a federal statute um, that particular, but we also have state, state mandates um, on what we need to provide to students um, for all types of, all types of um, uh, reasons. And we'd happy to go into that in more detail at another meeting if you'd like to learn about that. But that's sort of um, very interesting background on sort of why we need to, why our buildings have to be a certain size, why we have some certain types of teachers and what kind of programs that we need to provide. Um, and, and we continue to talk about, again, the expectation of high performing schools, which we are, and the COVID related educational needs. Next slide. We finally, at April, on April 6th, had another workshop. This is when we got our final revisions and we considered sort of one, one or two final decisions we needed to make. Um, we learned at that point that our health insurance surprisingly was 0% increase this year, which was excellent news. Um, we typically budget at the beginning of the process at 10%. As a, and um, we, we did learn a couple of weeks before this that there was gonna be a cap of 4%. So we were able to revise it down at that point. And then we got the actuals by this number and it went down to 0%. So one of the things we decided we, we, we needed to decide is um, how to allocate those savings. And we, we did have some needs obviously, and, um, um, but we decided to put that all into um, tax relief. And so we just took it off of the top and uh, those savings. Um, and you'll see where we landed up here is, um, and we'll uh, show a slide that has a little more detail, but um, we had ultimately a 4.8% budget expenditure increase with a tax impact of 3.45%. Um, that is the lowest um, uh, expenditure increase in three years and the lowest tax impact of our budget in more than four years. All, all in the time of COVID planning. So we, uh, we adopted our budget um, at the April 13th meeting and I gave a abbreviated version of what I'm, I'm giving you right now. That happened to be a very long meeting. We've been busy, very busy <laughs> and it came towards the end of that meeting, but we, we went into the, we went into it. Um, so and again, months of public meetings structured into a careful goal-oriented focus. We really are proud of this, this budget. Um, and I wanna just show a couple more details on the next slides. So this is where we started and where we start from the administrators is really where in their judgment, um, uh, we would uh, really meet our goals, the school board's goals um, to operate a school. Um, it's always a starting point, obviously, and not an ending point. But this is where we came in back in January. Um, it we would have had a 7.4% increase in the expenditures. Um, and what we included, and you'll see these because this will continue to the next slide, is there is a school nutrition deficit. Uh, and it, what I learned is that affects almost every school district in Maine. And it's a somewhat complicated reason on how, uh, how we're reimbursed and how the expenditures flow. We are, a per, we are in better position than most school districts. This is the other thing I learned, but we do have this deficit and we need to deal with it. Um, we, we're dealing with it structurally this year, but we still have this deficit from last year. So this initial budget it, it, um, did include the full 292 in it. The concept design for, for, the, for the school project as we've already talked about is approximately $300,000. There, there was an RFP process for that. And, and Scott Simons architects and Colby company engineers were were, were selected to move forward with some concept designs. Um, all the position requests from the administrators and contingencies and our contingencies, you know, sort of savings account of $100,000. After the whole process went through in the next slide, this is where we ended up. Again, um, um, what we, uh, with the increases that I showed you earlier, what we decided to do again um, with the taxpayer in mind um, um, is to spread and with COVID related funds, which I, I mean, COVID related expenses, which I wanna talk about um, is um, to pay half of that debt right now. Um, it's not the, it's, we, we are allowed to pay that debt over, over, um, over a couple of years. And so we decided to do that to keep the expenditures low because um, um, what we decided to do was increase our contingencies to 247. Um, and the reason why we did that is because again, one of our budget goals um, and really policy goals is to make sure we can go back to school five days a week this fall. And um, it needs to happen. And we just, and so uh, what we determined is that that's, the, that's the kind of money we needed to set aside $247,000 plus 
plus the $200,000. And I do want to talk about that a little bit for American, Re American Rescue Plan that we're getting. Um, and some of the positions that we did include that are COVID related um, responses, um, these positions, that this, is, this will get us where we need to go. And that will include um, paying for at least one um, portable classroom if the, if the spacing guidelines continue to be what they are today. Um, and some other uh, structural, structural related needs and, and support needs. And so this is what we need to do. Um, we also, and I know you're at the last meeting, you, you, um, you voted to uh, move our request forward on the concept design. But again, because of some of the COVID related expenses that we wouldn't have had in normal years. And quite frankly, we, we did not get a lot from the American Rescue Plan. I'm gonna talk about that uh, as much as we were, we're entirely grateful for what we got. But, but it, was not, it was not a significant amount compared to a lot of other school districts. Um, we really needed to, we needed to pay for some of those things out of, out of our general fund. Um, and so that's why we were able to make some of these um, decisions. And the short-term financing option really um, helped us with the cash flow issue because the you know, borrowing rates right now are so significantly low, 1.5%. Um, it allows us to spread it over a couple of years um, and uh, we can budget for that uh, next year when, when uh, two options, we either can roll it into an, an overall um, uh, bond for schools and or we can budget for it when we're not gonna have these contingency related funds, new positions, some of the new positions I'm gonna talk about and those sorts of things. Next slide. So here's our funding sources. Um, you'll see where the state comes in, our fund balance. That's what we had in our fund balance that we decided to use um, to reduce the tax impact. And, and some of it goes to contingency, quite frankly, uh, for the COVID related operational expenses and other revenue. The COVID related grant, grant money were, we were announced as the, from the American Rescue Plan it was around 214,000. Unfortunately, that was a lot lower than we were expecting. We were hoping that it was gonna be in the $2 million range originally based on one of the prior um, stimul uh, COVID packages. But uh, this particular fund, although it uh, was really high in the aggregate, um, used a funding formula that does not benefit Cape Elizabeth. So it used what they call the Title I ESSER funding formula, which is based um, partially on the percentage of your district that has free reduced lunch and homeless populations. And um, we, are we are traditionally a very low receiver of those types of funds. And so it's, we were a low receiver of this COVID um, stimulus funding um, as a result. So that really required us to put some of these position, these, these uh, expenditures that we were hoping to have paid for out of uh, the American Rescue Plan funding into our general fund to ensure we operate the district in the way that we need to operate it. Just to give you an example around, around here, um, uh, Portland, for example, got $17 million um, in that, any other bigger district, but there's, there's a very wide range of, of, of how those funds were distributed throughout the state. Uh, next slide. So this is a little bit small uh, type, but you can see this is where we ended up on the position request issues. Um, the, 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 the three positions I really wanna highlight are these math interventionists. And we, are, we funded a math interventionist at each of the three schools. Those are the types of, those, those are the positions that in the, we are directly adding as a result of COVID. Um, interventionist positions are for targeted instruction to support students as they work to complete their learning. And this is something um, that the administrators identified as a need as a result of um, some gaps in, in learning as a result of um, COVID, quite frankly. And uh, it was important to make sure we, we added these positions to keep um, and to help our students um, get to where they, they would be. Um, these are also the kinds of positions that could have been funded um, that uh, would be eligible if we had received more funding into the American Rescue Plan um, because a percentage of that funding has to be directly related to things like um, interventionist programming after school programming and other kind of positions that, that are a result of COVID the crisis. Um, but we put those in our budget to ensure that we had, the, we had them. They were very important um, in addition to the sort of building related issues we're gonna have to fund. The other positions you'll see are, are, are much smaller. These are again, like a point, you know, say a point 0.1 for an art teacher, a point 0.4 for a computer science teacher. These, these are to get to the levels that for our school board policy on recommended, you know, teacher load and class sizes um, and based on um, uh, needs of the students and what they're doing. So they're not full positions that are adding a course or two from different, different types of positions. Um, and then the only other, um, um, the ed tech positions um, 
and if you have a question about that, um, Donna might be able to answer that, but that you'll see it doesn't result in a real increase. That had to do with moving sort of from one line of ledger to the other, these head techs, uh, these three head tech positions for special services. Um, and um, we also did, and this will be an interest of you to you, and I know the finance subcommittee knows about this, this last line, director of educational technology. That's a new position that you'll see doesn't result in a, a large budget increase for us. That's the, that's the decision of the town to move forward with two, essentially two um, technology directors. Um, right now we've shared a technology director and um, it was identified as a need, um, really the school particularly this year, um, really needs its own uh, technology director. And, um, and so uh, we're out uh, advertising for that position right now. It'll be someone who's dedicated to technology in the schools and can coordinate all the tech um, leaders at each of the schools. Next slide. Um, I always think this is helpful. This just shows you how the budget changed over the course of three to four months. Um, and, and where we were and what we did to get to the reductions um, and what we removed. Um, I, I think I've addressed almost all of these throughout the time of my presentation, just kind of making sure, but yeah, so this, this is just like a nice slide to show you sort of where we started and where we ended, um, both with the total and uh, the increases. Next slide. So um, again, I, I I talked about the, the uh, health insurance costs that we passed on. And, and that was one of our last decisions to make because um, wondering if we could have put it into uh, some of our other goals, we decided to decrease the overall expenditure when we, when we got that great news. And our, our ultimate budget is a 741,000 reduction from the original budget request where we ended up. And again, includes three math interventionist program uh, positions and the contingency funding that would likely not have to be there in an, in an ordinary year. Um, next slide. So just quickly, we always like to make sure we met our goals. So our first goal was uh, to move, uh, I'm sorry, there are a couple of typos. I came off a vacation and was kind of getting this together. I'll clean it up for the, for the website. CESD um, forward with our strategic plan goals, um, supports the health and well-being of our students, global competency, multiple pathways and definitions of success, safe, sustainable, and effective facility as much as it can, and environmental responsibility for the reasons we just dis I discussed about the positions we added, the the financing, uh, short term uh, financing of the building, and there's that's why there's a asterisk there. Quite frankly, the, the um, our buildings are not um, effective or sustainable right now. That was the that was the conclusion of the building committee needs assessment, and the school board adopted that. And so that's something that we need to work towards to make sure that we're giving our students the best um, and safe environment we can. Next next slide. Um, so goals two and three to empower students with the academic, personal, and social knowledge and skills to build balance and purposeful lives and ensure equity and access to opportunities for all students. Again, we continue effective programs. We showed a commitment to mental, physical health, and wellness for all students. We met the enrollment demands and programmatic needs as I went through. Uh, we added a new director of technology. Um, the administrators and department heads worked as a true team to meet the needs of the system as a whole. And I would actually put, although I put it on another slide, I'd also put here the three math interventionist programs really do get to our goal of both of these goals. Next slide. And this is again, our prioritized full-time in-person learning um, in the fall. And uh, so again, contingency funding um, that we added the three math interventionists and the American Rescue Plan funding of 200,000, which is outside of our budget. And finally, um, we always do a careful line item, examination of light items. That's in uh, our Q&A each time, um, got into a number of those uh, line items. Um, we use the fund balance to lower tax impact for COVID related back to school planning. Again, the, the lowest increase is in three years. And the, uh, just to let you, just to give you sort of the context is the average tax impact of our budgets over the last three years was 5.78%. And this year it's 3.45%. And the last slide is just a nice quote from Benjamin Franklin that I kept from Elizabeth because I like that one too, and uh, it means a lot. So uh, that is our overview. Happy to answer any questions. Um, and again, I'm here, Marcy and um, Don are here and my fellow school board members are here. Um, any questions you have? 
Great, thanks, Phil. That was a great overview, um, especially coming off vacation with one typo in it. That's pretty good. Well, um, <laughs> a couple more, but I'll <laughs> clean those up. Um, so I think um, I, I'll just note for the record, um, we uh, have no attendees um, in the um, attendees section at the moment, um, but I'll open it up at this point uh, for any questions from the council. Uh, and um, yeah, we can, we'll go, we'll go from there. Jamie. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I, I don't really have a ton of questions out of the gate. Um, I just, you know, first and foremost, just want to thank the school board, um, thank the staff for um, all of the work and effort um, in organizing all the materials. You know, in the six years that I've been looking at these, I, I think this is one of the best presentations that I've seen. Um, so I, I think Incrementally, uh, the information gets uh, packaged up in a way that is, is um, you know, very easy to understand. Um, appreciate the, the overview um, presentation, Phil, that you just took everybody through and Marcy for your help in putting that together. I think, I think just, like I said, overall, I, I just am really happy to see um, how all the information is being packaged so that I think it, it, it makes it much easier for folks to understand. And if they do have questions, easier, um, you know, to find those answers to. So um, that was just the main thing I wanted to say um, to start. Uh, I thought I thought the the format and the and the material was was very uh, well put together. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. And I'm going to pass some credit on to a combination of Elizabeth and Marcy because I took two slideshows that they had and I combined them and and made my tweaks to them. So, uh, but that's where it comes from. And we want to, and to that point, Jamie, I think that's a good, uh, we want to continue to be consistent in how we show this. And so um, one thing that we talked about um, is, is to continue to have a sort of template on, on moving forward so that it's an easy to understand. I will add also that, remind me when I said we talk about it, but, uh, part of the, I think it's important that not only do we have this sort of finance subcommittee, but we added during the budget process, a Friday morning meeting every Friday morning um, with this, with the uh, school board chair and myself, and Marcy and Donna, so um, that that way that that information that was not happening. So that was we have a, a way to talk about the next meeting. Um, we didn't have any surprises about expenditures and changes and budget increases and stuff like that. So that that was a, a really important meeting. That I think will continue in the future as well. Great, um, Nicole. Yes, yeah, so I want to echo that this was very digestible. <laughs> Large, but digestible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just had a couple of questions. So I recently heard about um, school lunch funding was very recently talked about. I'm guessing that isn't reflected here. I don't know if you know if we're getting any funding from that. So that's a question, I guess. Uh, and maybe Marcy can talk about, are you... I I think you may be referring to fact. I think they announced that there's going to be an extension lunches again. It. That's right, an extension um, uh, for students to now have to pay next year. That's right. Right. But that doesn't necessarily reflect in our budget. Maybe Marcy, you could talk a bit about the school uh, lunch. Sure. Uh, yes. That, sure. Um, that um, money goes into a separate fund for school nutrition, which is the same fund that we transfer property taxes levied specifically for our share to contribute to the program to keep it running in addition to the money that we get from the state. So yes, that money from the state will has been happening this year um, so that students can eat and it's subsidized by the state and it will continue on. And so that's what we monitor. And uh, between Donna and Peter and I, we monitor every month where we are with the operation taking that in consideration, the state funding that goes into the separate fund, as well as um, what we will be looking at to uh, continue with the, to get the deficit cleared up by the end of the year. And then now we're obviously projecting out for a couple of years to, to get that going. But our, the, the school board's commitment is to make sure that in the next couple of years that we have that solved between the state funding and what we need to contribute from property taxes. Thank you, that helps me understand how it all relates. Um, 
My only other question was I saw in the budget changes one line item about only doing the NWEA testing for first and second grade. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious if that's a forever thing, a next year thing, because I do think parents are going to want testing in the fall to assess where people are at in order to see if we need intervention services. So that was the only other thing that was like, why would you remove testing right now? But I'm sure you'll address it. Yeah, so we're not removing it, but the state has adopted NWEA as the state test and they are paying for it. Yeah, that <laughs> um, is great news. Yeah. yeah, three through eight and then 11th grade. Um, so presently we, uh, we do the testing for the first and second grade. So they're the only grades that we have to pay for. But previously we've had to pay for all the grades. So um, so this is good news for us. So the test- Very good news. Good. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because I knew parents would want to know if kids are planned to be tested. No, it, it will continue. Uh, but we don't have to do those long MEA tests that we've had to do in the past because they are accepting, they've made it, they have a, con the state has a contract with NWA now. So we'll be using those tests for our um, state data to submit to the feds, so. Great, thank you. Great, I'm gonna um, give other folks on the council a second to um, think about questions. I see Jamie, oh, Jamie's putting his hand up with a new one. Um, I just wanted to follow up with a quick um, question more out of curiosity than anything else, um, but uh, somewhat following up on Nicole's question. Um, with regard to the math interventionist positions, I was just curious um, how you guys got to the number or, you know, the. The, the low uh, expectation for what the appropriate uh, staffing load on that would be and, and thoughts at this point, obviously it's very early days and we won't know until we get back in school, but um, is that something that, is that an additional capacity that you're anticipating will stay with us or is that something that we're looking at sort of as a one year response? Uh, yeah, so the middle school and the high school are one year positions. Uh, the elementary position, um, has been asked for in the past. So we decided to keep that in. Um, you know, of course we'll look at it again next year, but right now it's not considered to be specifically a one year position. But um, the feeling of the, um, the high school and middle school principals is that um, with one year of really intense work, we can get the kids where they need to be. So we won't need those positions in the future. Jamie? Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I kind of had a related question to that. Um, can you hear me okay? My audio just cut out for a second, but you can hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, um, the question I had kind of relates to, you know, the challenge coming out of the year that we've been in is when we get to the fall, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, we sort of won't know what we don't know. Um, and I, I wondered how much sort of, um, you know, ability to flex um, any funding if, if we get back into the fall and um, realize, oh, gee, this, this hole in terms of uh, sort of learning gap is bigger than we imagined and is gonna be harder to climb out of. And wh what, what can the schools do at that point to adjust if needed or, or you know, assign from unassigned fund or reserve, but um, didn't know if that was, you know, anything you, anybody wanted to comment on. Sort of a, a worst case scenario relative to learning loss, not necessarily to, you know, building space or anything like that. Um, so our, our principals are really good at um, realizing the needs of their students and switching staff around to meet those needs. So I think that would be the first thing if we noticed that there was, um, you know, a real deficit in one area that they would look to. Uh, we did a little bit of moving around staff this year to try to address the needs um, based on, you know, this crazy year. But I think they would be doing the same thing next year. So that would be, that would be our first move. And if that wasn't possible, then I think we'd be looking maybe into those contingency funds for addressing um, addressing that. It would be nice if more money came down the road, but um, we, we can't count on that, so. And then Jeremy, if you don't mind, a, a second question unrelated to that. 
uh, I was wondering either Donna or anybody else, if you could just go in a little bit more detail on the um, um, position uh, that Principal Mangiarides is looking for. I, I just, I, it caught my eye because it's coming back around again. I know the permanent substitute and Phil, I don't think you really touched on that as much um, in your, um, you know, uh, going through the detail on some of the position requests. It's, I, I know what a hard time it's been to, to um, find and, and keep a regular batch of substitutes. Is this really in response to that more so than, than anything else or? I think especially at the elementary school, having somebody in there that can just jump in at a moment's notice and the kids um, know, know that person and know the expectations. Um, it worked out really well. They had that position this year. We funded it through COVID funds, I believe, right, Marcy? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and um, it just made a world of difference for them to have that extra set of hands that could just jump in when needed. Um, so uh, we supported that. We, you know, Jason asked for that last year as well. And uh, we feared, we just thought that that was an important position to keep in there. It um, wasn't funded out of the regular budget though last year, right? It was from, no, yeah. No. yeah. Was so, funded out of the relief money. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, if there was any narrative about it, I don't think I saw anything, but I, I am just curious because I know one of the points of discussion last year about it was um, any kind of evaluation of, uh, I don't know, for, for lack of a better term, downtime, right? So we, we talked about, well, what, what would that person do if, and have they been just there every, every no day there's been a substitute need? There was yeah. no downtime for that. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, yeah. I, I don't want to say it's great. I, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to validate is the justification for it yeah. in that the, there is virtually no day that there isn't a need for a substitute. So. No, no, yeah, no. That, that person has been bu busy every single day this year, and uh, we would anticipate that the, the same would happen next year. So, Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, we'll go to next to uh, Gretchen and then Valerie. Thank you. Um, I'll just piggyback on kind of what Jamie was just talking about. I noticed with the subs that um, at least at Pond Cove in the last couple of years, it's been 90,000 um, budgeted, but have spent well under that. It was just that that just COVID related, do you think? Or do we consistently not spend that, that budget? Yes. Uh, are you talking about last year, Gretchen, with the act? how it ended at June 30th? Um, it just looks like under the Pond Cove that the last couple of years, there's been 90,000 budgeted for subs and we've not mm -hmm. even used half of that. And I was just wondering if that's COVID. That's, you think that's because of it was COVID related for the end of the year. And then this year we had the, the special COVID. The sub. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now what I'm finding is that by the end of this year, uh, we, we might even go a little bit over on we all these sub lines. Yep, because our COVID gotcha. money dried up. So that's what we're watching right now to make sure that that doesn't happen. But it's, we're gonna make sure our infrastructure is maintained to keep the doors open. So that's the that's the one thing that we're making sure that keeps things going. With the yeah. Yep. And then um, just to go back to what Nicole was asking about the nutrition services, it sounded like that deficit is an actual debt. Who, who holds that debt? Is it the state or the USDA or? The school, our school, um, our school uh, fund, so to speak. So okay. the, the auditors do their audit work every year and then they calculate what our debt is that we're carrying. And they only allow, we're, we have to pay back the debt within a three year period. So oh, essentially okay. it's the school, it's the school assigned fund balance debt. Paying ourselves. So Paying ourselves, speak. yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, this, it, but the state also is uh, monitoring, making sure that the entities are, are paying attention and paying within a, a timely manner as well. They have their eyes on it too, but mainly the auditors. Yeah, got it. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Valerie? Uh, thank you. Uh, I just, I wanted to first touch on the um, ARPA money. I know Paul, you had said that um, will receive $214,000. Is that a done deal? Is that finished? Do we know that that's the amount? Yeah, yeah it was, yeah, the, the main Department of Education put out a spreadsheet uh, a month ago or so at this point after the, after the state allocations were announced. 
Um, and so, yes, that is a done deal. I, I do think, and I don't want to get too far ahead of it, but I think we hope that there could be additional funds from the state allocation. So the state got its own pot of money separate from what was going to be pushed out to the, to the educational units throughout the state. Um, and I, you know, Marcy or Donna can talk about that. We don't know exactly how that's going to work, but we're hopeful that maybe we could qualify for some of that on the sort of potential on the infrastructure side. Um, but we don't have the details about that yet. So if that, if that is, if that comes through, obviously that would help us and help us with our contingent, you know, the money we set aside the contingency we may not have to use for that purpose. And we could potentially use it for, um, the rest of the debt, for example, of the nutrition side. Oh, good, good. Yeah. I was going to just yeah. ask that's my next question. Yes. Yeah. Um, because I noticed, I, I thought when we all spoke um, a couple of weeks ago, that on one of the handouts you gave us, it said that there was a $1.1 million reserve, um, that the school had $1.1 million this year, but I'm only seeing um, $700,000. Is that, was that a typo or is that money somewhere else? And what you're seeing, um, Councillor Devereaux, is the um, assigned fund balance that will be budgeting the 740,000. And then the unassigned is the number you saw from the audit of the 1.4. So um, yes, that is correct. Um, not a typo, just that we have to uh, only budget and we have to, we can't include the entire amount. Um, if, I mean, we could budget for the entire amount but the commitment right now is to maintain at least, um, I think it's a 1.5% that we're trying to maintain right. as an unassigned fund balance. Does that make okay. sense? So then that way we'd have that money if, if um, there were overruns as Jamie was asking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Minimum amount, okay. right. All right, and then the CARES Act money, that's finished too. Um, we received what we were going to receive and there's no more money coming in on that. Fortunately. <laughs> No. Okay, I'm just curious. Um, I didn't see it detailed in the budget, or if I, if it was, I didn't notice it. Um, and then I was, I was wondering about. Um, there's a couple pages that um, in the binder that you gave us mm -hmm. that are um, sort of a pull out, fold up page that looks like yes. this. Yes. Yeah, that's one of our favorite pages we always say yeah, every year. Yeah, we love that page. That's, that's <laughs> They're really great. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So it gives an overview of um, what's gone on basically the last yeah. four years and then right. our projected um, year for next year. Uh, and I was just, and I may, I maybe Marcy can explain this, in the 2020-2021 um, column, mm -hmm. It says state contribution. And on one of the forms, it's um, a million seven thirty four three sixty four. The other, it's a million seven thirty two six thirty two. Did the number change or is the state not giving as much money? So um, are you referring to, so we're getting about the 7,000 more this year. But what I did, I don't know if you're looking at previous ones too, Councillor Devereaux, but um, the contribution used to be split out between, we had a, the number at the top and then what we had a number below that was the contribution for our, um, oh, Donna, help me with the word, the regional. Re regional service center. Okay. Regional services. Sure. And we we've decided to combine that because truly the total amount is the state contribution. And so I decided to put it as a total rather than splitting the, the two amounts because it could get confusing if you look at a state report and they are listing their state contribution and it's not split out. And it, it was just, it was just getting, I, I just thought for uh, lack of confusion, it was easier to put the total state contribution as one line. Well, I agree. I'm just saying it's different. Um, and I thought the year was finalized and finished, the 2020, 2021. I know we haven't hit oh, the fiscal yes. year end yet. Yes, um, I know what you're talking about. But I noticed the number was different. So the percentages yes. were different at the bottom of the page That's for right. this year. Correct. Thank you so much. Yes. At the very end of the year, the state does their audit and they will withdraw from our contribution, anything that is um, part of 
the special education program for Medi Medicare, I think is what it's called. So if we have a student that qualified for that service, they withdraw it from the uh, state subsidy amount at the very end of the year in their audit. And they'll subtract it from the very last um, contribution payment. So yes, so that will change. What happens is it changes the percentage when you're looking at the two years, it does, it changes the percentage if you look at a, a report from the prior year before their audit. I call okay. it, an audit. it's an, adjust, an adjustment, sorry. So there was an adjustment made in between the time that while you were working on these two different budgets. Yes, yes. Our budget numbers. Okay, so um, then, my um, my next question, I guess, to Matt, basically, at the bottom of that page, it says um, median home, three hundred fourteen thousand dollars, and it kind of, it shows the tax impact of the schools portion of the uh, budget on the bottom. Um, I'm just curious if um, it says basically 3.45, but that's, um, that'll be with just the school's portion without the municipal portion, correct? But the other numbers have both the school and municipal. Is right. that right? You okay. It, yes, in the pro forma that um, John Q puts together, yes, it has both rates together. That's correct. Okay, so, so in the last four years, taxes on a median home have risen basically a thousand dollars a year in four years now. Um, I'm, I guess my question is, well also I'd like to know about, um, before I go there, the decrease in enrollment. It looked like we had um, 1,575 students the year prior and then this year we had 1500. What are you expecting for enrollment and how did you? Um... <laughs> that is a big question right now. But I know, how'd you get that number? <laughs> well, what happened was um, when parents found out we were going, some parents found out we were going to the hybrid model, some parents chose for, for what, many, many different reasons um, to homeschool their students some parents chose to send their students to private schools. Uh, what we're hearing from parents is that they plan to um, send their students back um, in September, knowing that you know, we're planning on five days a week. Um, so we, our projections are what they would have been if we had uh, retained those, those students. Okay, but there's, there's been, it's not a, a, a firm number, it's just sort of an estimate. And, and it never is because always, yeah. always, always in the summer we have people move in, people move out, and we don't really know what our kindergarten numbers are and we probably won't know until the first day of kindergarten when they all show up um, because some people don't register their students ahead of time. So um, we make a projection and, and uh, we've, we've always been able to, to operate within that projection and um, we have enough seats for students, so. Okay, okay. So I'm, I guess my question just comes back to the, um, uh, somebody who has a $300,000 house has paid, their taxes increased $1,000 um, over the last four years. Um, and I, I'm guessing most people's homes don't um, the value isn't 314,000, it's much higher. Uh, we had a 5.95% increase last year, 5.9, and now a 4.8 with a big decrease in enrollment. And I realize we have COVID. Um, however, we are getting a little bit of money for that. How are we going to, what's the plan for the future with such a continuing decrease in enrollment? Um, I just don't see it as sustainable. Yeah, actually, to increase you, taxes um, five, six percent every year. Yeah, we had some projections done and it really showed that our enrollment would be increasing. This was just a particularly crazy year. And we do believe um, from what we've heard from parents that the students will return 
Um, and and we're, uh, we've been pretty level for the last couple of years, take away this year, but we've been pretty level. So we, we haven't seen until this year, large decreases. Well, uh, uh, well, I guess you mean by 75 students, but I, I was looking at the form that you gave us in the packet and it's decreased every year. Um, so I'm just kind of curious if there's a plan. Um, well, I, I, to that, I, one thing I do is I'd encourage you to look at some of the materials that the building committee looked at because um, there were projections included there. And, and then we actually went back and had updated projections as a result of some questions in the building committee. And so it did show at least a relatively flat, if not slightly increasing, if I remember, at least relatively yes. flat going forward. Um, and so we have a pretty good handle on that. I mean, this budget reflects what it will cost to, to educate the students that we have today um, based on our policies, um, what, what the kind of school that we provide in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we do every year, right? So, so uh, in terms of class size, teacher load and things like that. Um, and of course, just like on the town side, there are certain increases that are, that are, that are uh, part of staffing and that are built into the budget. Um, that are going to increase every year based on contract, you know, contractual relations and things like that. But certainly our goal, and you see that, was to get this as low as we possibly could given our budget goals and the COVID-related uh, funding that we really felt we needed to do this year, given the circumstances. Right. Well, actually, I was on the needs assessment committee and the billing committee. I um, have read the documents and I've looked at uh, numbers throughout Maine and through other um, school districts. Falmouth is also um, <laughs> decrease in enrollment. There's other school districts that are all decreasing in enrollment. So, um, I, and just looking back at not only enrollment, but um, budgets over the last, I don't know, since 2006, each year there was basically a 3% increase, maybe a 2.16. Um, 1.28, 3%. And I would venture to say that our school has been excellent during that time. Um, I think that most people would say we've had an excellent school district and excellent um, school. So I'm just curious as to why we're at um, five and 6% increase each year with decreased enrollment and what you see as um, what we're gonna do in the future. Cause I, I just don't see it as sustainable. I, I don't believe we can continue to um, increase our school budget five, 6% every year with a decrease in enrollment. And um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see how people in our community who are getting a 1% cost of living increase, people that have lost jobs, there are, um, people that have had to stay home and um, care give or take care of their kids because they're not in school. How, how are they gonna continue to pay these kind of taxes? So I'm just curious if you have a plan, if you've talked about it, is there some, something that um, you've thought about to, to put this back into balance? Well, I don't know if Donna or anyone else wants to chime in. I would just say, I think, yes, we look at it every single year as part of the budget process. And, and what we try to do with this budget is to maintain the level of school um, excellence that this community demands. And, um, and I'd say we have a very good track record of having the community support our budgets at the polls every single year. We do try to get it to be the lowest possible um, under, this, under the guidelines that we have in our, uh, in our policies in terms of class size, interventionist, the kind of programming that we provide. It also, I'd say, you know, I, I showed you the sort of chart in terms of the dip in, in state aid to education and that really affected um, uh, this department. We, we get a, we're one of the lowest receivers in the state on the state, on the, on the state funding side. And so, yes, it, you're right. You're absolutely right that it is a very tax-based uh, sort of local um, funded program here. Um, compared to other school districts. Um, and it is, and it is a, a function 
of it partly a function of the way our school funding formula works at the state level. Um, and so, yes, it's, continue, it's something we're going to have to continue to watch and, and to work forward to. But I can tell you the people on this board right now are dedicated to making sure that we keep it as, as sort of slim and limited as possible, but also provide the kind of school that I know that people here demand. And the reason why they move here and live here is because the school district um, is as excellent as it is. And, I, and, and we hear from the, you know, it's, it's really, it's been, it's an educational for me to hear from the, the professionals who run our school department on what it takes to really educate the students in the way that we really want to as a community and the kind of investments we need to make. Um, and if we were to not do that, I think you would see, I don't think you would see that excellence continue. And, and that's in our, in our judgment as a school board, this is what it's, this is what this budget, this is what it takes to continue the kind of school that we want in this town. Okay, my concern is the eight and a half percent tax increase to taxpayers this year between the municipal budget and the um, school budget. When you add the 3.46 and the 4.8, um, that, uh, that's a pretty big increase for um, taxpayers. And I realize it won't be exactly that amount because our tax base is going to increase. However, even a 7% increase is a huge increase during this time. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really concerned about that. And I'm really concerned about um, people who, like I said, got a 1% cost of living increase and some who didn't get any cost of living increase. It seems um, that it, it's very, very high and I don't see how it's sustainable. So I'll leave with that. Penny, Thank I you. see your hand, but I'd like to give Matt a chance to jump in. Sorry, I almost jumped, uh, almost jumped through the screen. Just, just to, if it's helpful at all, Council Devereaux, it's not uh, uh, cumulative when you look at the, uh, the pro forma, for instance. Uh, this year, the projected total tax rate increase is 3.41%, uh, where you'd have like the, those numbers that show the percentages, but due to the percentage of each budget that it contributes to the overall tax rate. Uh, so for instance, on the town tax rate side, uh, or at, let's, let's start at the largest, on the school side, that's roughly 74% of the tax rate. So that's the lion's share there. But that's at, you know, the tax rate impact at 3.45%. So that's at, let's say, 74% of the overall mill rate. And then the county, which is roughly 2%, uh, 1, 1 to 2% annually of our tax rate. So that's a 2.3% increase. But proportionally, it makes a very uh, small impact to the tax rate. And then finally, the town at Roughly uh, the remainder, which is 22, 22, 24% in that range can, uh, annually. So it, it, you'll, you'll see how the, it, you'll show the tax rate increases on the pro forma that we have. That'll show the percentage to the tax rate annually. So for this year, the town at 3.51% increase over last year's rate, uh, which is 14 cents. And so that all accumulates uh, to the overall 68 cents to the tax, to the tax rate itself. So. Um, if that's helpful at all, it doesn't add up to the eight uh, plus percent there, but it's more like 3.4% uh, uh, cumulative. And um, uh, so that, yeah, they, it can sometimes get you glazed over when you, when you look at that as it accumulates, but hopefully that was helpful in understanding how uh, the overall rate impact uh, hits. Yes, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Um, uh, Penny, I'm, I'm going to go to you next. I just want to say, um, I think after we've heard from Penny, um, at least all of the counselors will have had a chance to pose uh, a first set of questions. And I did see Elizabeth's hand go up briefly. Um, and I, so I just wanted to let you all know what I'm thinking of after Penny is that um, I'd like to give uh, members of the school board a chance to add any additional um, comments or questions that you may have for the council. Penny? Hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry I'm late to the party. I, um, <laughs> but you were in my arms. I just want you to know <laughs> in my truck. Um, anyway, I, I want to echo uh, Jamie's words. This is probably one of the best budgets I have seen this school board put forward. And uh, I appreciate the hard work that went into it. Each year when I look at the um, school budgets, there are uh, key components that I, I look for. 
Um, I look for the fact that you're balancing the academic needs of all students, and I see that definitely represented in here. The social and emotional needs of students, and especially, and as well as the nutritional needs of the students. Um, I think this budget hits all of those elements, um, and I. I truly want to congratulate you as a team because I know it's a daunting task every year. And I think you know that I'm pretty critical when it comes to if I identify something in the budget that just doesn't make sense. But um, I, just, I just think you guys hit this one out of the park and I thank you for it. Well, thank you very much, Council Jordan. I really appreciate that on behalf of the board and the administrators. Thank you. Um, and so we can come back if counselors have thought of any additional questions, but I, I would like to open it up now for, for um, anyone from the school board, if there are any additional comments that you guys have on this year's budget, budget process, or any questions that you have for the council. I'm going to jump in quickly and say I only rose my hand because I knew that Mr. Sturgis was, I knew what he was going to say because I Having done this before, I knew that what Councillor um, Devereaux was saying was inaccurate. And I was like, Matt, Matt, <laughs> that was all I was doing. Yeah. Well, I just want to echo what, what Jamie and, and, um, and Penny both had to say about this year's budget, both in terms of the content and the presentation um, with a big thanks to, to, to Phil and, and Marcy. Um, and I also want to make sure and extend a, a thank you to Donna um, for all the work that's gone into this. Um, and it's been a real pleasure working with you over the last couple of years. And we're going to miss you, um, oh, miss your face you. at these budget sessions next year. But I hope you're doing something maybe even more enjoyable than this. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. We obviously feel the same way. We're going to miss her. <laughs> Um, if there are no other, oh, um, yeah, Gretchen. Thanks, sorry. I did just think of one other question. Um, I was curious, I'm looking at the enrollment and staffing and I'm glad, um, Phil, that you touched on the EPS. I didn't know what that meant on that first page when it says uh, EPS total teachers. I'm just wondering, is there a number that we're aiming for um, in terms of the percentage? There's that column, it says percent over EPS for teachers. And it seems like a lot of our peer Districts were kind of in the middle there. Um, is that is that a number? Do we have a a goal for that for that number? Yeah, we do, and maybe Donna or Marcy can jump in. But we do have a goal. We have a school board policy goal, and um, that we use as a guideline and a recommendation that we try to meet, um, which is above and beyond what the EPS. And I would say a lot of school districts do go beyond above and beyond, but we like we and we do too. And we're not at the highest, as you noted. So, um, mm -hmm. but we're in a place where I think that we provide um, the best education we can given our budget constraints. Mm -hmm. There's a really good, um, I, there are a couple of materials that I can point you to or I can email you later, but in our budget packets over the last few months um, where we got into that a bit, including, like I said, Jeff Shedd's presentation on EPS. And that's, I, I direct you to that. Um, um, and if I can remember what day, maybe I'll email you the link. I'll put a note to myself there. That'd be awesome. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I find that really interesting. So super. Thank you. That was all. <laughs> You're welcome. Jamie. Um, I did want to ask a question and, and maybe it's something we can pick up also in the ongoing um, subcommittee meetings too. Um, more to long range planning. And I know that there were um, what seemed to me to be a higher than normal number of retirements this year. Um, the superintendent now <laughs> part of that as well. <laughs> but, um, and, and I'm just curious, um, I know one thing that we've talked about when looking at, so obviously it was touched on just a second ago about what a large portion of the pie salaries and benefits are. Um, and I think, I think we've had discussions through the years about, um, you know, we benefit from having a lot of long tenured staff and teachers, um, but obviously that comes at a, a cost as well. And I, 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 I'm curious with the number of retirements um, that are being registered this year and, and whether or not there's been any sort of um, recent look from a sort of district-wide perspective about 
sort of what that bell curve looks like right now and, or whether or not it does look like a bell curve or, or what, so, and, and maybe what we might be able to anticipate in, in the next several, you know, uh, near to medium term years. Well, um, we are an aging staff. <laughs> um, when you look at a lot of the teachers, um, they have been here a very long time. Um, and so it's time for them to retire. So I'm not sure what you mean by bell curve, but um, are you, are you so, thinking, do we have more than usual or? No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm talking to bring it back to South. So on the, on the assumption that, you know, somebody who's long tenured and at the top of the, the compensation scale doesn't necessarily get backfilled with somebody at that same level, oh, right? right? So right. Um, in terms of net to budget, um, are we, are we, as you just said, we, you know, we have an aging staff and, and presumably there's a, a sort of my, my hypothesis not hypo, you know, my assumption is that there's, there's a bubble that's kind of sitting there. And I'm wondering if in, you know, relatively short to near term, you know, medium term budget years, we're going to be looking at mm -hmm. potentially a flattening of the salary and benefits number, just as a function of how we choose to replace that staff. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. And sometimes it works out and, and sometimes it doesn't as far as people leaving and, and replacing people. Um, and um, the, the younger people are, uh, their longevity is growing. So as, you know, as we're dealing with all this, they're also increasing their salaries. Um, by the, the number of years that they've added to, to their teaching. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we do look at, um, you know, the salaries that our older retiring teachers are making. And, but, but then when we, when we go to replace them, you know, we, we try to pick the best candidate, not the cheapest candidate. So. Um, yeah. And I didn't mean to imply yeah. that. I, I meant yeah. just more of a natural function of yeah, experience. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, somebody that's got, 30 years of experience, probably somewhere different on the salary scale than somebody one with 10. Things, but. Yeah, one of the kind of unusual things about Cape Elizabeth is that when teachers come to us, they generally stay. Right. So, <laughs> um, so we do have staff with longevity and, and I believe that we will continue to have staff with longevity. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but we do have an aging staff right now. And there will be, you know, that there have been some teachers, um, some older teachers that have retired, some teachers with longevity. And certainly we would look to, just to save as we hire um, newer teachers. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? All right. Well, um, thank you all. Um, I'd like to thank all the members of the school board for joining us tonight, as well as, as Donna and Marcy. Um, this has been very useful and excellent presentation. Um, the only remaining item on our agenda um, is a review of the upcoming finance committee workshops and budget meetings. So we do have an additional finance committee meeting tomorrow evening. Um, at six o'clock again. And on the agenda for that meeting is a review of the schedule of fees. This is a new item that um, we've added to our budget review process um, that we'll be looking at tomorrow. We'll also be looking at any um, adjustments that may, may be needed to the budget and how well the budget aligns with the council's goals. The, there's a, we have a special town council meeting scheduled for Monday, May 3rd um, for a public budget hearing um, and a vote on the special revenue funds. And then at the regular council meeting on Monday, May 10th, there will, will be voting on the fiscal 22 um, budget with a um, citizen vote scheduled as part of the June election on June 8th. Uh, are there any questions, comments on any items related to that, Jamie? Um, yeah, Jeremy. Uh, to you and, and to Matt, were we not tomorrow also going to have some level of discussion with the school board about some of the upcoming um, out year capital expense kind of item? You know, it, basically, 
I, I, I thought we were going to do a, a little bit of sort of blocking and tackling around, well, you know, sure roads coming up over, you know, fiscal 22, 23, and probably into 23, 24 from spreading out that cost. Uh, you know, here's what, um, you know, potential budget scenarios look like with, you know, various renovation or replacement school plans. I, I, I thought we were going to look sort of where, where all those things were coming into alignment with one another. Is that, was that still part that, of the plan or not? I think that was, I think that's correct yeah. as well. Okay. I remember that conversation. Okay. And then also, um, uh, 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 Councilor Gabrielson, there's also the, uh, this would be a special town council meeting, uh, at the conclusion of the workshop tomorrow night uh, to set the uh, public hearing for, for next week, uh, formally okay. set that, and then an exec session uh, after that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so I guess I would just, to, to add on to that, um, Jamie, I, I would invite any members of the school board um, who are able to join us tomorrow evening for that portion of the conversation. I know we're anticipating that, uh, you know, there's some large capital items coming up sort of on both sides of the ledger. Um, and what we'd like to do is just sort of start looking at, at how that, you know, what that schedule of capital expenditures might look like over the next three to five years and start planning for that together. Um, apologies if for not giving more advance notice on, on that discussion. If you're able to join us, that would be great. And, and if not, um, we can also uh, begin that conversation tomorrow with whoever's here and schedule a time for some additional follow-up um, once we've once we've gotten through this initial budget season. Penny? Oh, oh, yep. Oh. Um, when are we talking, and we might have said this, but my brain sometimes forgets things. Um, when are we talking about the $300,000 criteria around the $300,000 um, potential um, loan around, when are we talking about that criteria? Because I would assume the school board would like to have an answer to how they're done, how we're gonna finance that 300,000. So I, I assume you're referring to whether that would be self-financed or financed through a, um, a bond issuance? You've got it, kiddo. Okay. Um, Matt, did you wanna, do you, did you have a response? I'd, I'd be happy. To, I'd be happy to, Council Gabrielson. Uh, yeah, we we have that lined up to be on the uh, on the on the tenth meeting for the discussion on the policy question. And so uh, the council will, ha will have that at that point in time uh, with the uh, with the uh, directed uh, refinements and revisions uh, prepared and, and and bringing that forward for that for that meeting. And and Matt, so I, I I'm just curious. Do you anticipate? That there would, I, I mean, I would imagine one, there may be a, a, a slight cost differential between those two options, but, but net to the school budget, um, it shouldn't, it, the, there's no relevant difference on how the town chooses to finance that debt, or am I, am I incorrect in that assumption? It, it would be more expensive to go to the open market, but uh, but generally it's a three hundred thousand dollar expenditure on that side, and then what the cost of uh, the debt service would be would be uh, within that within uh, operational budget for the school. And the, so the amount of that initial debt service is, is included in the school budget, which was was just presented. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Devereaux. Oh, um, thanks. I I thought that we had put that on um, May 5th for our town council workshop. I, I, I don't believe we had a workshop scheduled for the 5th. We have the 3rd uh, with the, uh, the, the special meeting next week and then the 10th. I have May 5th on my calendar. I have May 5th as our oh. workshop. Well, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. So if May 5th works and then we can have that in advance for the 10th, for some reason that one snuck by my uh, radar. So uh, I'm, I'm more than available on that night <laughs> for sure. So uh, that's great. Thank, thank you for that, Council Deborah. I apologize for the, uh, for the oversight. And it's Cinco de Mayo, just so you know, Matt. Maybe that's why I get confused. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't start early. <laughs> Bill? 
Yeah, I just, uh, thanks. I just want to circle back quickly to this um, discussion tomorrow, um, which is the first I'm hearing about it. I think it's a great idea. Um, it is a little short uh, planning. I want to make sure that it's, you know, it's a valuable discussion. And I think it's a discussion we have to have. I, um, I'm wondering if it's something we, that would be better for, you know, get through the budget season. I'm happy to come tomorrow, but we, we have, um, we're obviously about to fund a concept design, which will include more, more um, information about the actual funding that we will, you know, about the actual at, uh, costs. And so um, we know that we have this coming, but we don't have all the details yet, um, yet. So I, I just want to make sure that the, the conversation is, you know, productive. And I strongly recommend we do it. I'm just wondering, you know, given the timing constraints and uh, I'm sure we could pull somebody together, but I, it was not something that was on our radar for tomorrow. No, thank you. That's helpful. And, and I think that makes sense. Um, you know, I, I, on the town side, I, perhaps what we can do tomorrow is take a look at some of the capital items that we anticipate having coming up on the, on the town side um, as okay. part of our discussion tomorrow and just sort of get some of our own um, our own ducks in a row, if you will. And, okay. then, um, and then maybe we can look at scheduling another joint session similar to this um, for, for June or July. Would that be, would that kind be of great. work? Uh, we could even push it back. But I, you know, I think, I think the, the idea was really just to make sure that we're, you know, we're all communicating as, as best we can right. as full bodies um, around some of these larger decisions that are gonna drive cost curves. Um, you know, on both budgets over the coming, you know, three to five years, um, whether that happens tomorrow night or, or later, you know, a month or two from now, I think is, is, you know, we're, we're, we can be flexible on that. Okay. I mean, I think that would be a great idea and we are equally as committed to having those conversations. So I, I do think it would be more productive a few months out and we can continue to work on that. I know we do have, um, you know, our finance subcommittees and maybe we can through yeah. those the, through those meetings, uh, come up with a time and uh, that will be appropriate. That we'll have the right information that we can bring to you, so we can have a good conversation about it. I, I think that sounds like a good item to put on that coordination meeting okay. tomorrow morning, perhaps. Um, good. Talking about what the timeline is, and then we can report back to um, to our respective boards. Great, thank you, Jamie. Yeah, and then, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, sorry if there was a miscommunication on this. I, I, I actually thought we had talked about it at our previous subcommittee group, and it, and frankly, it, it was more an exercise I think for for staff to come to both of us to tell us about what the what what were sort of some of the known things, and where the planes might be kind of stacking up on the runway a little bit, and so if if Donna and Matt and John and Marcy aren't prepared to do that, that's totally fine. There's no urgency to do it tomorrow. The only reason we had talked about doing it tomorrow was because we already had this meeting calendared to just take advantage of not adding another meeting date to everybody's schedules. But there's no there's no um, imperative to have it tomorrow and, and um, th that's fine, so. Yeah, I remember us talking about it too, um, but I, you know, I'd rather have the conversation when we have that you know, the, the right information in front of us. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. Donna? I think it's actually on our agenda for our um, subcommittee tomorrow morning. So maybe we can just do some planning and, and uh, okay. how that's gonna work, so. Great. That sounds great. Great. Uh, with that, um, I see we have one attendee now. Um, and so I will open it up and see if there's any comment from the public. And if there's not, I will, uh, Matt. Yeah, Councilor Gabriel said that's uh, uh, Susanna. She's uh, she's doing the, the write up of tonight's meeting. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, always nice to offer though. <laughs> um, and um, if there's no other comments from anyone else, I think we can adjourn. All right, Great. thank you, thank you very much, board, and we'll see the council tomorrow night. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, guys.